It's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, always a, an honor to be invited to this, these conferences. And uh, thanks for listening um, to, I, I love Ramon's analogies. I thought they're just great. So I thought I would start out with a, a kind of a fun slide and why do giraffes not faint? Before I even get to that, I'd just like to explain what the autonomic nervous system is and does by an example. So if you're at, in Los Angeles and you're heading uh, to the beach, and as typically happens, you suddenly get in, you're in your convertible Porsche, and you suddenly run into a um, traffic jam, and it's gonna, you know it's gonna be three hours before you get to the beach, probably not much is gonna happen. But if you're in your little Ford Escort that's got one tire that's not working very well, and you got your first job interview in two years, uh, and you run into a traffic jam, so you know you're gonna be late, to the interview, what's gonna happen? Well, your blood pressure is gonna probably go up, your heart rate's gonna go up, and if you're really scared, you might even have a bowel accident of some kind, or a urinary accident. And that kind of summarizes, in a nutshell, what the autonomic nervous system does. It's managing your body to coordinate it with what's going on in your mind. And if you're really good with yoga, or can take some deep breaths in, you can probably control all of that. So it's really not a system that just works off by itself. It's a system that's coordinated with your brain and reflects various stages of readiness. And that's really one of the major things that goes wrong in multiple system atrophy. You're no longer able to coordinate what your brain says your body needs to do with what the body actually does because the coordinating centers in the brain are no longer working. I'm gonna focus on just one thing, which is blood pressure, why your blood pressure doesn't work or blood pressure control doesn't work. Uh, and I'm starting with this slide, which is uh, giraffe versus man. And giraffes don't faint, even though they're much taller than we are and have much more um, cardiovascular demand. They don't faint. Um, and the big difference between them and us is the amount of blood that's beneath the heart when they're standing. So when they're standing, we, I, I taught a class, at, um, some undergraduates at Case, and we went to the zoo and we saw giraffes and a veterinary giraffe expert told us they're basically cows on stilts. That's what they are. So I thought that I kept that in my mind, a cow on stilts. The point is they have essentially no blood in their feet and that's actually used the way the giraffe manages its leg to build the space suits so to un because it constricts so well. If you compare that to human being, you'll see that the amount of blood in that picture below the heart is a huge amount of blood. And it's actually a miraculous feat that human beings can normally stand up. It's a little bit like the bumblebee being able to fly and get off the, off the ground. So, now, how is this all done? I'm not gonna go into detail here. Just, I'm just mentioning the word baroreflex so you've heard about it. The baroreflex is basically like the thermostat in your house for heat. This is the barostat, the pressure stat, in your body for blood pressure. It's got two parts. It's got one that makes blood pressure come back up if your blood pressure drops, and one that makes your blood pressure come back down if your blood pressure goes too high. And in multiple system atrophy, this thing basically, the centers that coordinate this stop working. So it senses changes in blood pressure and it adjusts blood pressure. And really the only thing I want you to remember from this slide is that the main thing that needs to happen if your blood pressure drops is your vessels need to tighten up. We don't have the giraffe's suit system so we gotta tighten those blood vessels. Anything else is really not gonna do too much. But we can do that externally by giving you some um, pressure hose. And that's the point of pressure hose, is to make you a bit more like a giraffe. So if your vessels don't constrict, we can still get blood back up to the brain. Um, now, it's important to realize that in MSA, not only do we fail to raise blood pressure when uh, the, uh, when you stand up. We also fail to lower blood pressure when you lie flat. And I'll show you that in just a second. Now, 
we are able to test uh, these various features in what's called an autonomic laboratory. How many here have had autonomic testing? we have gone to a lab and had, yeah, so I see a fair show of hands, probably, a, you know, a, a, at least a, a, more than a dozen people. And I'm not gonna tell you all about autonomic testing, I'm just gonna focus on one thing, which is the cardiovascular system. And the tilt table test basically tells us if you have orthostatic hypotension or not. It means does your blood pressure drop when you stand up? And that's shown in this particular slide where you see that uh, here's the person tilted up here. This is the tilt angle. The person is tilted here and you see the blood pressure drop, drop, drop. This particular person is able to compensate by increasing the heart rate. But you can see that it doesn't actually do a lot. The heart rate increase helps a little bit. But once you're not able to maintain blood pressure, uh, that's a very difficult problem to resolve. Now, orthostatic hypotension can be neurogenic or non-neurogenic, meaning it can be a neurological problem or not a neurological problem. If you have MSA, it's going to be a neurological problem. But we don't know that when we first see you come into the office the first time. So the autonomic testing also includes what's called a Valsava maneuver, uh, where you kind of put pressure in a tube for 15 seconds. And during that time, we measure, are, is, are your blood vessels able to compensate for this? Are you able to maintain blood pressure during this? And um, I'm going to use the arrow for those who are watching on video. So you, you see here, the person puts uh, pressure into this tube right, sorry, right here. And then right about here, blood pressure begins to drop a little bit. And you can see this person is well able to compensate because blood pressure then after, this is a 15 second period. And during this 15 second period, about six or seven seconds, the blood pressure is dropping. And then the person compensates very well and comes back up. In contrast, this is a person who's perhaps has multiple system atrophy. You can see that they have that initial drop, and then what happens? It keeps dropping. And that's pretty much how we define neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is through the Valsalva maneuver. We can tell that the problem is the nerves are not telling the blood vessels to constrict, probably because they're not getting the message. Now, this slide shows the point I was making before. Uh, trimethapan uh, tr uh, is, is, a, is a very, very old drug and it blocks the ability of norepinephrine, which comes out of the uh, sympathetic side, the fight or flight side. It blocks the ability for that to happen. And the point of this slide is to show that when patients with multiple system atrophy have high pressure, how many here have supine hypertension have dealt with that? So supine hypertension is not that common, but when you have it, it's not just that you took too much salt or did too much during the day. It's actually that your baroreflex is providing a signal, is saying constrict the blood vessels at a time when it should not be. And that's what this slide shows. If you block that system, then patients with multiple system atrophy do not uh, have that high blood pressure, that supine hypertension. So it's a problem that comes from the brain. Okay, now I just want to say a few words about how you manage blood pressure. And uh, most physicians are very familiar with the drugs or somewhat familiar with the drugs. So I'm going to emphasize here things you can do, things that not relate to drugs to help manage your blood pressure. Now remember, you've got two problems most of the time. You've got a problem that your blood pressure is too low when you stand up. And you've also got an issue that your blood pressure may be too high when you lie flat. So you have to manage both of these and timing is of the essence. So um, one of the big things, when people come to my clinic, one of the big things I see is that physicians have put them on all the right drugs. They're on, perhaps on mitodrine or droxydope or any of these. But the issue is they haven't told the patients to take enough salt. Think of it this way. That big picture we saw at the beginning with the giraffe and the man, that's your well. And if that well is not filled with fluid, it's very hard to pump it. So the drugs mostly pump, except maybe for high doses of Floridef. Most of the drugs just pump 
the, the, the well system. If your well is empty, the pumping is not going to do a very good job. How do you fill it? Mostly with salt and fluids. So most of the patients I see who come to me are not taking enough salt so that the drugs can really be effective. Um, now, this picture is really to remind me to talk to you about microgravity. So every time you lie flat for more than an hour, you experience what's called microgravity, which means that your system is not being triggered to maintain blood pressure. When you do that for eight hours overnight, you experience a lot of microgravity. That's the reason we tell people to elevate the head of their beds. Now, when the astronauts come back from uh, a space flight, and actually this was not taken, this was taken before they went, but when they come back from uh, space flights, Typically, the pictures are taken in the space suits. And you figure, well, that's for good advertising. No, it's not for good advertising. If they come back from a space flight and you take them out of their suits immediately, they're going to faint because gravity is required for the signal to be transmitted. If you don't, not exposed to gravity for a couple days, as the, uh, maybe many days, as the astronauts are, then your system stops functioning and you no longer have the barrel reflex. So think of MSA as being also not responsive to the gravitational signal. Now, how much salt do you actually need to overcome to fill the well? Probably about eight to 15 grams per day. So somewhere around two to four, normal American diets, probably about three grams a day. You need way more than that. You need at least twice that. Uh, and um, uh, it's only limited by if your blood pressure starts going up too high. That's what limits it. Uh, high pressure hose are another way, we talked about that a little bit earlier, makes you look a little bit like a giraffe and makes the leg do the work for you. And uh, elevating the head of the bed is how you eliminate microgravity. So you have, and then you, you eliminate much less uh, fluid or body volume during the night. Uh, and then you have less supine hypertension. I had a call from a resident one day who said, um, your patient with multiple system atrophy, the blood pressure is 250 over 150, what do I do? I said, just sit them up. That's all you have to do. Then the blood pressure will be 120 over 80. Uh, salt has two actions. May, people may not be aware of this. One action is to, um, uh, is to have an acute effect which raises volume. And the other action is to have a chronic effect that constricts the blood vessels. So start with two grams twice a day and go up. This shows the effect of, do I need to stop? Uh, well, how about two more minutes? Uh, just shut me up when I'm done. Uh, so this shows the effect of various uh, non-pharmacologic measures on uh, plasma volume. Uh, and these are fainters, so it's the time to the time they faint. And you can see elevating the head of the bed, that's symbolized in the black symbols, does a very good job of increasing total volume. Salt, the square dots, does a pretty good job. And exercise is something else I recommend, does a very good job as well. Now, um, a few other non-pharmacologic tricks up our sleeve. So this is to help the vessels constrict. The others were to expand the well. If you drink water, that's been studied very carefully, if you drink water, a big glass of water in the morning will elevate your blood pressure about 30 to 40 millimeters of mercury uh, in uh, about 10 minutes and will last about an hour. So we recommend everybody do that when they first get up in the morning. Um, frequent small meals because insulin is a vasodilator. The physical counter maneuvers, I've got a picture of uh, in a second. And then physical exercise improves how the barrel reflex functions, presumably by, ex by exaggerating the role of gravity when you're exercising. And then self-tilt exercises are very, very important because they help the system constrict. So let me show you these. Uh, so this is a picture that shows the effect of drinking water. Um, does that show up? Oh, it doesn't show up on the slide. Okay, so I guess I have to use this. Um, so in increasing water drinking, you see the blood pressure come up after uh, drinking water. Uh, these are the counter maneuvers. So if you feel like you're going to faint, you can do any of these. You can squat, you can uh, tighten your legs, and that'll increase the blood pressure acutely. And this is the effect of tilt training. You basically stand up against the wall 
and uh, you stand there for five minutes or so. And this shows you in a group who have who faint how well they uh, they do. So initially they're fainting at about 10 minutes. And after two weeks of tilt training, they're able to stand 30 minutes. Um, so that's very important. Now, I'm just going to cover four drugs uh, rapidly. Drug number one is fludrocortisone. Most of you have probably either on it or have tried it. People don't, are not aware that it has two effects. In low dose, it makes norepinephrine work better on your blood vessels. So it produces a better response. So I sometimes use it in a very low dose, which is a half a pill three times a week, if that's all I want. If I want to fill the well better, then I use the normal dose, which gives me an increase in blood pressure. The next drug is a drug called pyridostigmine. It's a little bit like power steering. So what power steering does is you turn to the right and it helps you turn more to the right. You turn to the left, it does that. Pyridostigmine, when you activate the autonomic nervous system, it just activates it a little bit more. And the nice thing about it is it does not have much of an effect on the lying flat pressure. It only increases the blood pressure when you're standing up. Midadrin, probably most of you are familiar with. It does the job norepinephrine does by constricting the blood vessels directly. It lasts about four hours. You should be careful not to take it when, if you know you're about to lie flat. And then the last one I'm going to cover is, uh, it's, it's quite old, uh, it's 30 years old, but um, it's, uh, it's only been on our market for a few years. And droxydopa works like L-dopa for, uh, for dopamine, droxydopa works for norepinephrine, it allows your system to release more norepinephrine. Um, so I had a few slides on supine hypertension, but I think I'm going to skip those in the interest of time. And I want to thank you very much for listening, and thank you for the MSA Coalition for inviting me. Thank you.